Welcome to the Modern Cloister, where we cultivate deeper thinkers and worshipers through conversations about the Christian life, in the same spirit as the conversations that took place during the Reformation at the Black Cloister, the former monastery and home of Martin Luther and his wife, Katharina von Bora. I'm Carissa, and I'm here with Kevin, and we're so glad you've joined us here at the Modern Cloister. If you like the types of conversations we've been having, we encourage you to rate, review, and subscribe. Connect with us on social media at Carissa Turner and the J. Kevin Turner, and send us your thoughts, questions, experiences, and suggestions for future topics to moderncloister at gmail.com. Today, we are continuing our series on the five solas, which are the five foundational doctrines of the Protestant Reformation that are still as relevant today as they were in the 16th century. They marked the breaking away of what is now the Protestant Church from the Catholic Church and continue to provide the basic foundations of our theological beliefs. However, while they remain incredibly important today, many people, including Christians, are unaware of them or do not fully understand their implications to their everyday life and the life, practices, and beliefs of the Church. In this episode, we're going to talk specifically about another one of the solas, Sola Christus, or Christ Alone. However, if you have not yet listened to our introduction of the Reformation and our other episodes on Sola Scriptura, or Scripture Alone, Sola Gratia, or Grace Alone, or Sola Fide, Faith Alone, we encourage you to do so before listening to this episode, as it will provide you essential historical background and context for these doctrines and our overall discussion. So as we begin, Kevin, talk a little bit about the relationship in particular between the three middle solas of the five sola. Sure. The Grace Alone, Faith Alone, Christ Alone. Um... As we said, the past two, those are really mixed together, really tied together. Um, you know, it's it's that we're saved through grace alone, by faith in Christ, right? So it's hard to talk about them separately. Um, we gave you a warning up front, especially for the faith alone one, I think. Uh, if you listen to that and, and thought, how could you not talk about works at all? This is why, because it's the works of Christ. So we actually, this one's actually made a little tighter than the other. So it is going to be pretty heavily on who Christ is and his works. So, you know, why Christ matters in the sense of what he was, what made it different, what made his work different, and then our works versus kind of going back to our faith. But again, faith in Christ, that is the person of Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, So actually, I think this one will flow a little better. But yeah, you were probably expecting the works and the faith. um, But this one we're going to roll through with the works of Christ because that's that's really what we're talking about. That's really what matters here. Uh, So, Carissa, what... Is Christ alone? Great question, and we're going to define it. High level, Christ's work, not ours, being what saves us, is the Christ alone doctrine. That there is nothing else needed for salvation, that Christ is the only way to salvation. This is really focused on the object of our faith. If you joined us for our last episode, we talked about the faith alone concept that Kevin just mentioned. That was really your belief in what saves you. It is is the action of belief versus the action of works toward your salvation. And this is the object. So what do you believe in? What is your faith in? And because it doesn't depend on our work, we can't lose our salvation, which is one of the biggest assurances that these solas in general provide to us, but in particular, this one. And so in order to understand the doctrine of Christ alone in its entirety, we're going to look first to the historical context of it. So Kevin, talk us through some of that. Yeah, and we've said this on everyone. It's a reminder of why the soli, sole, why there's plural. It's it's the alone is the most important part. Obviously, the church 500 years ago, 600 years ago, there was no doubt that you needed Christ. There is no salvation with that. That was not at all up for discussion. It, it's, again, the alone part, the sola, right? That it's only Christ's work. It's the sufficiency of Christ's work. We added in uh, numerous things that, uh, that we talked about in the intro, um, one onto it with penance, indulgences. Uh, sacraments were the big one because certain ones were actually required. Mm-hmm. Um, it's how you received grace. You know, again, it's that ongoing work of grace. Um, but also the belief for many that, you know, baptism is required, which mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if we'll talk about this now or later, but it, that's actually still something people believe. And if you're requiring anything, and I mean anything, we're still, you're adding works on top of it. Mm-hmm. It becomes not Christ. It's Christ plus. And so, again, it's the alone part. At the time, it was Christ plus. It was Christ plus the sacraments, Christ plus alms, mm-hmm. Christ plus penance. And, of course, penance, indulgence, and all these other things that aren't even biblical was what's the worst part of it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it was so controversial at the time that you wouldn't add any of those additional requirements onto it 
to receive the work of Christ, that there was actually even within the circle of the reformers, a lot of fear that it could lead to just no moral code at all, which I know has a fancy word that I always mess up. I'm going to let you yeah, say it. Yeah, I noticed it. you skipped it on the script <laughs> I here. Did, Antinomianism. Yes. Uh, nomi <laughs> being works, anti being no. So no works. Yes. No law required, um, which is something that, that still, we'll get a little more in this later on and implications for today, but th- that's still an issue today, especially in the reformed world uh, podcasts, say reform podcast, but I guess we are. So we'll throw that out there. <laughs> uh, that's, that's still a charge people have. They'll say you're being antinomianism. You're saying we don't need works. You know, you don't need to behave essentially, you know, you're too licentious. Right. Mm-hmm. And of course, this is absolutely nothing new. And I don't even mean since the reformation, Paul addresses this. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he this does. was, this concept was hard for people in, so Christ died in, you know, around 30 AD, give or take a couple years. Um, Paul was writing in like 10 years later and he's already saying, y'all, look, it, I, I get it. Should we sin more so that grace abounds? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 it's nothing new um, because people want work. So let's let's jump into faith versus works here yeah, right now. That's, that's a good place to do that. Uh, right. So again, people, people find it hard and, and people often like to hold up uh, James 2... Did I bookmark it? I did. Yeah, two fourteen. Um, you, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but basically says, uh, "Can faith save you if a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food?" And one says, "Go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply bodily needs. What good is that?" So, uh, so faith by itself, if it has no works, it's dead. People really like to point to this and say, um, "There, that proves it's faith." And uh, you know they'll contrast it with Paul because, of course. Uh, later on, James will use Abraham, as will Paul in Romans 4, about um, what exactly it was that Abraham did that would, became mm-hmm. credit to his righteousness, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so the issue with here in James, there's a couple of them. We're not going to go too deep. I'd recommend if you're, there, there's a million articles about this. You could just search it and you'll get it. If you read these chapters in any commentary or any good uh, study Bible, you can kind of get a good... Um, get, get a good feel for it. But there's a couple things wrong with this approach. One is uh, taken out of context, right? That's everybody's favorite thing to do, Christian <laughs> or non, is to just pick a verse they like and say, boom, there you go, all done. So that's that's a terrible thing to do, and we all do it and we all shouldn't because Paul in Romans, obviously, and James here are writing to different audiences. You know, one's actually Jewish, so when they mean law they're in works, they're actually talking about the Torah. There's still some of those issues going on. Of course, Paul's letter to the Romans is surprisingly to the Romans. And so they have a completely different thing that he's trying to reach back and point to. Um, the other thing is, in this letter, James is coming out of talking about not showing partiality. So as that flows through, then you go in about the impacts of your faith. The whole chapter before, actually it's not even a chapter, the first part of the chapter He's saying, if you have faith, if you are in Christ, if you have a brother, how can you treat your brother uh, impartially, or not impartially, I guess? How could you treat people different based on, really, income is what they're talking about in this one. So you move on to the second half of two, and he's pointing out that you have a dead faith, which is to say, you don't have faith. So that's, that's I guess, well, I'll kind of wrap it up there, is... is James' point is you are not proving yourself. You have a dead faith, which means you don't have faith. You have mm-hmm. not resting in Christ. And um, and just another interpretive thing is to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Uh, that's another way of saying, again, don't just look at the one verse. If this was all we had was James, or maybe just all we had was Romans 4, it could get a little confusing, but go read Hebrews 11. Go read anything in John. Go read anything in Isaiah. Like, this is... Mm-hmm all kind of tied together. So I know people bring that one up a lot uh, and they say it's dead. So again, we are not saying you should not have good works. We are saying those good works do not save you. Like you cannot love your brother. You know, and John says, if you Mm -hmm. do not love your brother and then, you know, the implication is you treat them accordingly, then you do not know Christ, Mm -hmm. right? So if you have been regenerated in Christ, if you live in Christ, then you will have works that are good. We are saying those works do not save you. So that's the antinomianism and the idea that 
you must have works that you, you can see how those go together. Yeah, right? you absolutely yeah. Can do. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I love the way you said and differentiated that works are, I mean, they are required of us to obediently walk out the Christian life. Right. They are just not required for salvation. Right. And so I love how you separated those out. And I think that's a distinction that we should and can remind ourselves of quite often to help that line stay clear. Right. Can often and, blurry. you know, we talk about sanctification in our kind of how we're flowing through this uh, election, justification, sanctification, yep. and this being the last part is, you know, you have Christ baptized in the spirit, right? So mm-hmm. now it's the works of the spirit. All of these outwork was a fruits of the spirit, not yep. works of the spirit. It's well, spirit working in you, but the, the yep. outpouring of the spirit in you is the fruits. And those are going to manifest themselves in works. Yeah. Those are not salvific. Yeah. Those are proof. I don't want to say proof because that leads too many people to question and struggle. And we'll, we'll dip into that in a little bit, but it's, it's kind of a thin line, but it's a very important one. Yeah, absolutely. We've talked a little bit so far about the overall doctrine of faith alone, not faith alone, Christ alone. <laughs> well, we did talk together. about faith alone. We did faith alone. alone last time, yes. And they and they do go together so, so closely that it is, even as we're recording this, um, saying them both interchangeably. But the, the doctrine of Christ alone being that Christ's work is sufficient and all that is needed for salvation and is faith in that work and in that person of Christ that is so pivotal to salvation. And so we do want to spend some time now transitioning just a little bit to talk about the person of Christ and about the work of Christ that we are resting the assurance of our salvation in as part of the discussion about this Christ alone doctrine. And so at a at a very high level, and we're not going to go into the details of this because scholars have been, you know, talking about this topic for, I mean, so many years, but the the biblical identity of Jesus is essential to this discussion because he is the object of the faith that we are claiming. And so it is so important that as believers, we understand who Jesus is in his entirety, in both the way that he was the fulfillment of the scriptures and all the prophets and, and the way that he was the promised Messiah and even the the different characteristics that he displayed. Um, and we'll talk about this just shortly um, about his life in particular. But one of the things that is so critical to understand is that he was both fully God and fully man. And many of you who are listening are familiar with that. And on its face, you're like, yes, that is, you know, I profess that I believe that that is absolutely true about my Christ. And so as we start this discussion, we just want to take a a, a backup a little bit of why that is such a critical point as the entry point into the Jesus discussion. Right, yeah, this was a huge discussion in, in the early church, uh, especially as it spread out, left its kind of, you know, original Jewish roots. So probably the, the biggest push for this, um, along with the Trinity, is uh, Athanasius. You can read his On the Incarnation. I highly recommend it. It's super short. I think it's like 90 pages. Um, the language is like 100-year-old English, so it's, and it's, you know, it's translated by, mm-hmm. a, like, a British lady, so it's it's a little higher. It sounds a little fancy in some parts, but... <laughs> Uh, you know, we have the Athanasian Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, or as I heard some Scottish people the other day, Chalcedon. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. doesn't matter. Those creeds were important, and the focus was that it's fully God and fully man. And yes, that is confusing, mm-hmm. and that's okay. Because not being fully God and not being fully man means that the works aren't complete. Mm-hmm. So if we had just God just kind of appearing, you know, as a bubble or a spirit, kind of the docetus, Marcion, like some of those other heresies, then then we still have work to do. Or if Christ was just a prophet and not God and did not fulfill perfectly all the law and was not that perfect sacrifice, that propitiation, you know, that, that we talked about in the faith alone, if he could not do that because he was just a man, then we also still have work to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, there's there's a lot more. There's there's all kinds of things that go. I'd really highly recommend On the Incarnation or just just search the importance of fully God and fully man. And you can find a couple brief histories. There's some good things out there. But without that, all of the promises, all of the commandments, everything mm-hmm. in the Old Testament had to be fulfilled in Christ, had to be perfect, and had to be the perfect sacrifice, right? Mm-hmm. So we had to have all these for it. The work to be complete, essentially, yeah. and that's and since the work is complete, it is finished. That's why there's nothing left for us. Yeah, absolutely, and that is a perfect segue into the next little bit, which is what is the work of Christ? And to your point, as we talk about these next couple of things, it is important to keep at the you know the top of your mind that all of these things that Christ did were done being fully God and fully man, and is because of that 
that these had the impact and significance eternally that they do. And so when we talk about the work of Christ, we're going to talk about it in four different main categories. His life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. Now, I don't know about you, but oftentimes when I have reflected on the the work of Christ, I specifically zero in on the death and resurrection of Christ, because that is really the pivotal cornerstone moment, if you would, when both the wrath of God and the love and mercy of God were on display. And I know that most sermons and most preaching and a lot of just general Christian talk within the church focuses on these almost exclusively when talking about the work of Christ. We occasionally branch out and broaden it to the life of Christ, and I think most churches do talk about it in in a threefold life, death, and resurrection, um, because that is also a really noticed and important element of it. So when you think about those, you have the life of Christ, which, as Kevin mentioned before, because he was fully God and fully man, he was able to live the life, the perfect life, that we could not, being born under, under Adam. He was then able to die the perfect death, and also resurrect and defeat death. But then past that, we have this whole area, and and I've talked a lot about this with with Kevin lately, is that there's this whole area of the work of Christ that I haven't really seen talked about much, at least in our circles, which is the ascension of Christ and and the work of Christ that comes in that when he ascended into heaven and was glorified at the right hand of God. And with that, then his spirit was poured out to all people. I think that being a work of Christ is an important thing for us to to ground ourselves in. So So again, when we talk about that work of Christ, it is all four of those elements and his perfect accomplishment of all four that is the work that we are resting in. And I think that's really important for us to remember because looking straight into the face of Jesus and knowing what he did allows us to have that assurance because it was was work that we couldn't do for ourselves. And from there... Another aspect of the conversation about who is Jesus and who is the, what is the work of Christ is looking at the, the offices of the Christ alone doctrine. And this, unlike the, the discussion of the work of Christ that were time sensitive, that was his life, you know, a particular event, his death and resurrection and his ascension, is more the roles that he played. Would that be a good way to put it? The roles. Mm, and you offices. may have heard this before, the offices, yes. Um, the prophet priest and king offices of the Christ alone doctrine. The the prophet, of course, being that Christ served as the revelation of God. Um, And the Old Testament prophets were really, their main goal and function was to speak God's word to the people. And so Christ in his incarnation and then in his life served the role of the true and better prophet being God's full revelation to man and his full expression of himself to his people in his coming and being with us. And then fulfilling the true and better priest. Again, in the Old Testament, the priests were those who mediated for the people for their salvation. He represented the people before God. He would offer gifts and sacrifices in the temple. And so you see here again the office of Christ in fulfilling and being the better version of that priest is to be the true mediator and actually didn't just offer gifts and sacrifices, but also became the gift and sacrifice. And then the third office, which is just beautiful, is this picture of him being king, the lordship over our salvation, the one who rules and reigns and governs that salvation. And, you know, looking back to the Old Testament again, we see that the ultimate expression of kingship was really bringing God's rule and reign to the world. We see that probably most pivotally through David and some of in some of those stories and the way in which um, his life went. But then when you look at it through the Christ lens, him coming and doing the work of Christ inaugurated the kingdom of heaven. So he brought the true and final rule and reign of God to the world and inaugurated that, that, yeah, that heaven, that heaven kingdom. And so I think as we think about the work of Christ that we're resting, it is so critical to really expand our mind and to sit in these, these big ideas and these big concepts that are given to us because they, they show us the true depth of what we are believing, and I think they enrich our view of, of the work and person of Jesus. Anything you'd add there? Uh, no, as we move into the, the implication for today, I think it's good to remember that not everyone... Oh, go back up. I want to get that language right there. Yeah, so you pointed out in the priest, uh, he's mediator for our salvation. He also... Christ is still a human body in mm-hmm. heaven at the right hand of God the Father, and he still mediates on our behalf today. Yeah. So again, it, it is finished, right? But he is our mediator and which is why we pray in Christ's name too, yeah. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as well. You know, so I think that is forgotten, of course, and it's it's still not the doctrine today for some mm-hmm. churches. You know, that's a doctrine in, in Protestant churches. 
Um, but that's still for today, which is not in our notes. So let me get back no, on track No, it's not, here. but I'm so glad you mentioned that because <laughs> that goes into the ascension It's still something thing. that they have, right? Yeah. yeah. So he, he still mediates. He is, which is why we don't need a mediator. That is, we do not need a priest. We can go directly to God through Christ. We can go directly to the Father through the Son and um, by the Holy Spirit. Trinity, amen. So the rest <laughs> yes. of the yes. implications for the church. Um, we, we mentioned most of these. Uh, already that for the inside of the church it's still just that that belief we we just want to be a part of it i mentioned this in the grace alone um when i got the wrong <laughs> started i started with yeah. the wrong uh, metaphor which we don't cut out because honestly we don't have enough time but it's the idea and a lot of people probably heard this before it's someone stands up and they say here's the gift but you have to get up and take that gift and it, that's and people are well-meaning by this. And what they mean by that is they want you to say a sinner's prayer, respond or an altar call, or some sort of profession of faith, um, which, of course, especially if it's in a Baptistic context, um, you know, I think some of that comes out because we don't have the confirmation, we don't have mm-hmm. the profession of faith, so you just feel like something needs to be there. But that is really a pushback. That is our sovereignty, not Christ. That is us wanting to do just Christ plus 1%. And mm-hmm. y'all... If Christ does 99.99% of the work it takes and all we have to do is that little bit that's left, we're going to fail. Mm -hmm. It can only be Christ. Even if I have to get up and take it, Mm -hmm. right, then I won't. That's what we talked about in the grace alone. Mm -hmm. Yes, the grace alone. You would reject it. You would be like, man, I don't don't want that. I got all this other stuff over here that I'd rather do for me. So the, the, like I said earlier in this one is, is the, antinomianism charges still exist um there's a podcast i used to listen to uh and and whatever they just changed over a bunch of guys i don't listen to more so i don't recommend it but i want to call it out for not being good anymore they um (laughs) that's fair yeah it was it was great uh they just they switched through some hosts whatever and you know they would read emails they would read you know twitter or whatever and things that they receive from people saying you know this really sounds antinomian you're really not and they're saying all, all the things we said before. So this is still an issue. It's still a struggle for people. And um, and you see that in some, especially kind of Pentecostal and uh, kind of the holiness charismatic movements. They, there are those who still believe that you must be baptized to be saved. And whether they want to admit it or not, that's just another work. We're going right back to that, to, to the Reformation, prior to the Reformation, yeah. saying, no, it takes this one little work. You must, sure, sure, sure. It's, it's all Christ you know, Christ alone, but also you must be baptized. Yeah. Just, but it's Christ, but it's not. It, yeah. it has to be Christ and Christ alone, or yeah. we will fail, because that's all we can do. Yeah. You want to hit the outside? I do, that's yes. all I got. All I right. Know, that went long. It's so good, though. <laughs> I love hearing you talk about that. It's it's just, it's so true. And the implications for outside the church are really vast and really interesting in this one. So last time we... We talked through a sola was the faith sola, and we mentioned in that episode that the faith alone sola was really the least offensive of all the solas mm-hmm. because most people are broadly okay and accepting of faith at a high level, that people have faith in something regardless of what it is, whether it's in religion, whether it's in yourself, whether it's in the stock market, whether it's in, I don't know, your friends and family coming through for you. Faith is a generally accepted concept. Yeah, that's, this, let me let me jump yeah. in. I know we mentioned politics last time with the... Um, you know, faith community or whatever. Faith is so important that when they survey people about, you know, various groups, you know, Muslim, Sikh, atheist and agnostic always come in last. That by every other group, so Jews, Christians, Muslims, they all say they would vote for a Jew, Christian, Muslim over an atheist because not having faith seems a little weird. So I don't know. I just thought about that. Maybe that's, that's, should have fit that in last one. But anyway, keep going. Yeah, no, absolutely. On the, on the flip side of that, this sola is absolutely the most offensive. And that's because this sola claims the exclusivity of Christ alone as the way to salvation. It says there is no other way but Christ. If you have faith in anything else, it is not a saving faith. And that is incredibly, incredibly offensive to our culture. There is, there's a, a quote that we shared a couple episodes ago about really in this culture, in our postmodern culture, if you come in saying that you know the only knowable truth that exists, you are seen as arrogant. How could you? How could you tell me what I should believe? No, that's just true for you. My truth is this, that is so pervasive in our culture that claiming the exclusivity 
of a saving faith in a person, in a tangible person who is both fully God and fully man that we can point to is just the most offensive. It is a direct clash with this postmodernist culture. And if you listen to the Sola Scriptura episode in particular, we walked through some of the implications through the Enlightenment period all the way up to our postmodern society and what it has done to really tarnish the, the Christ alone doctrine because of the way our culture views truth and the preference and elevation of your own experience over an objective outside truth. And there's a quote in this um, in this book that that we read that's a full five sola series, and this is from the Christ alone book, but there's this quote in the in the Sufficiency of Christ chapter when it's talking about what it looks like to stand with the reformers today in this doctrine. It says this with the reformers and and actually, in this case, the Roman church held in common because at the time, they, there wasn't a division over the person and the work of Christ. It was over his sufficiency. But it says, Christ's unique and exclusive identity was rejected by the Enlightenment as non-factual. Today, in our postmodern era, it is viewed as inconceivable. This reminds us that our challenge of confessing Christ alone is similar to, yet different from the Reformation era. In standing with the reformers, we must remember that our proclamation of Christ alone will require an entire worldview events of Christ's glorious person and work. So I think that points to why, even in preparing this episode, we expanded to really talk about who Jesus is and the full picture of his work and the offices of, of who he is so that we can stand and stand with assurance and understanding of what we're professing. Yeah, and... You know, it's interesting that there's probably nothing worse than being exclusive. And it's just so interesting to think about. Like that's, that will get you rejected and that is, that will get you attacked, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what's, that's bigoted. That's Mm -hmm. discriminatory um, because the best thing you can be is exclusive. And there's interesting kind of philosophical discussions going on right now because most people believe we're past Mm -hmm. postmodernism and uh, I've seen it, the ridiculously named post postmodernism, mm. but then also the post truth, uh, which I would, which I would actually lean towards that as a, as a good name for it. And Christ is the way, the truth and the life. And no one goes to the fathers through him. Uh, again, that's an exclusive claim and an exclusive view on the truth that Christ is the truth because right now everyone's definition of truth is what works for you. Like that may be, and people may be listening to this and say, well, that's true for you, but it's not true for me. And that's just not how truth works, except for it kind of does here in our, our post-truth world, which yeah. is uh, alternative facts, I suppose. Yeah, it really does. And in fact, as you were saying that, I was looking up because I knew there was another quote in here that I really liked toward the end of this chapter. It kind of summarizes some of this, but it says, before the Enlightenment, people found it impossible not to believe the Christian worldview. Starting with the Enlightenment, it became possible not to believe in the basic truths of Christianity. Then, 300 years after the Enlightenment and the rise of postmodern pluralism, most people now find it impossible to believe in the objective truths and ultimate concerns of the Christian worldview. I think watching that shift just tells you so much about where we are, and I think that's why it's so important to really understand what these doctrines mean, the the history of where they came from, and why they are still so critical for us to understand today, because only in understanding that history and what they mean can we really... As, as the book even challenged us to stand with the reformers more securely in professing these truths that we have claimed for hundreds of years. And so with that, I think that's a good place for us to end this episode. We hope you have enjoyed. And again, we love listener feedback. So if you have been joining us for this discussion and any of the others, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how these discussions have been going, what you may have been picking up along the way, or any thoughts and questions that you're running into as we talk about the five solas and their meaning for us today. So with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.